traffic and parking advisory board meeting to order good afternoon and welcome the traffic and parking advisory board reviews items of interest regarding parking and traffic items we are an advisory board and our favorable recommendations today will go before the Oshkosh Common Council the council can accept or reject any recommendation we make if you don't agree with our decision you can discuss the item with any council member if the board does not recommend an item a common council member may in fact sponsor new ordinance regarding that same item all items do require two readings before the common council the first reading will take place on tuesday october 26th at 6 p.m and you will be allowed to speak on the item at that time though the council will take no action on tuesday november 9th at 6 p.m the item will be on a second reading at which time the council will take action you will again however be allowed to speak on that item at that time for this afternoon's meeting i will read each agenda item at which time if you'd like to speak please step to the podium and give your name and address i do ask that you keep your comments pertinent to the agenda item the item will then return to the board for discussion and ultimately some action please call the roll to ensure a quorum staple here hansen here Lonschneider. here becker here christensen here and Marone. All right, which brings us to public comment. And looking around the room, I don't believe there's a member of the public here to avail themselves of that. So we will then immediately move to approval of minutes. So moved. Second. Anyone have any comments, questions, additions, or deletions to the prior meeting minutes? Seeing none, I will ask the roll be called on approval of minutes. Staple? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Wanschneider? Aye. Becker? Aye. Christensen? Aye. Which then brings us to old business, and I don't believe there is any at this point, so we will then immediately move to, again, new business. First item being the Merrill Middle School New School Traffic Flow presentation. And with that, Mr. Collins, I'll turn it over to you. All right, um, just to introduce the topic, the, the Oshkosh School District's building a new Merrill Middle School. Um, on the site of what is currently their athletic fields. Um, so they can give you more information about that. But as part of the plan, they were required to do a traffic impact analysis. Um, so the school district has Bray Architects um, who is with us and then Taddy who did is the company that did the traffic impact analysis. Uh, so they'll be presenting their recommendations for traffic flow. So that's what we'll be looking at here. Um, so I'll get Don's here from Taddy, so he's going to do the presentation, and um, we'll kind of go from there. We also have Nate from Bray, and I'll let you guys do the introductions. And you guys, you guys can probably do better introductions, but at least that introduces the topic. Sounds good. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Nate Constantine with Bray Architects. I'm um, happy to go through the first couple of slides here with you and then hand it over to Don. As mentioned, Don is with Toddy um, and was the third party consultant uh, brought in to do the traffic impact analysis. So showing on the screen right now is uh, the current site plan uh, for the new building. Um, although uh, Merrill has been the popular name, uh, the building is going through a process of, of finding what that name is. Um, so we know that it will not be called the Merrill School, but uh, for the purpose of this meeting, uh, that, that's what's uh, recognizable, so we'll roll with that. Um, as we look at this site, I think it's important to notate that the bottom right-hand corner, where it currently shows two soccer fields, is the current Merrill building. Um, we understand that Merrill building will stand uh, for the duration of this construction, plus one additional year, um, while the new elementary school is being built. Um, the construction sequence will take <coughs> approximately 18 months, um, and then again that year overlap. So with that, a little bit of context of showing where those soccer fields are located, um, just a, a piece there is that we understand that the current Mer uh, Merrill site, um, although I think it would be, thank you, Don, um, would be likely um, raised uh, to support green space for the new building, as obviously um, the new building is built on green space and therefore they lose a lot of the green space uh, that kids would like to um, have recreation on. Um, that the future of that building is still be, to be determined. Um, and we realize that this is a historic building, or I shouldn't say historic, but is historic in uh, relevance to the neighborhood. Um, quickly going through the site, 
Uh, we have a large parking lot on the south side that will support, I believe it's roughly 160, star, 160 stalls, which meets uh, the parking requirement for the building itself. Uh, we have a parent uh, drop-off along Kentucky Street, um, which would be where the secure entrance is on, on Kentucky. Um, secure entrance being that it may look like the front of the building, but it's simply the main entrance for people that are visiting the building between 8.15 and 4 p.m. So all visitors will be, from a safety and security lens, um, be put in through one entrance to the building, although students will be entering through a variety of spots throughout the building. The north side of the site would be bus uh, parking and drop-off and pickup. Uh, we have support for five buses on the north side. And then we have one access point off of Jackson Street, um, uh, direct, directly across from an adjacent street um, to help with intersection flow of traffic. This access point um, will be deterred by a four-foot fence along with landscaping. Um, we'll have delivery uh, drop it or delivery access only. Um, parents are not to be permitted to use that spot. Um, and per conversations with the city of Oshkosh. Um, a future gate could be installed if not used properly. Um, in that back loading area, you will see that that is uh, not the back side of the building, but another front side of the building that simply supports uh, some of the maintenance uh, pieces as it relates to the support of this building. Um, the, the way that the building is facing, as it's facing more or less Jackson or, uh, Kentucky Street, was very thoughtfully um, considered by the school district. Um, not only to just uh, support our, our neighbors and, and trying to be relevant uh, adjacent uh, to, the, to the homes that we have to work around and the neighborhood that we are in, but also with the high volume of traffic on Jackson Street, we felt like putting parent drop-off, kid drop-off, um, some of those high traffic things that would occur at two specific times of the day on Jackson Street would not be the safest of solutions. Uh, so therefore, having uh, the large front um, being on Kentucky Street was, um, from a safety perspective, um, the most important piece to the school district. Um, now, to accomplish that, what we brought Toddy in specifically to talk about is, is the flipping of the one-ways. And as you guys know, as part of the agenda, um, currently Kentucky flows from south to north, and central flows um, in the opposite direction. In order uh, for the secure entrance and the main entrance to work, um, you typically do not want students getting out on the right side of the car, passing over the front or even the rear to cross the street to go to the entrance of the building. So if we kept the streets um, as they are currently designed, um, and our main entrance is specifically on Kentucky Street from a safety lens, uh, they would have to cross traffic to enter the building. So again, from a safety lens, the thought process was to flip the one-ways um, and have Kentucky Street flow from north to south, allowing parents to pull up to an extended kind of cutaway curb that would not be in the loop, and uh, then exit the car on the right side and go directly to the building. So just a little bit of background to of why we're flipping the one-ways and why the building is facing the way that it is. With that, I'll hand it off to Don. <coughs> So my name is Don Lee. I did the traffic study. I work for traffic analysis and design. Um, the study area is shown on the screen here. We studied, uh, the, the dots are the intersections we studied. We studied 11 intersections plus all the driveways, the proposed driveways to the school. Uh, the intersections that we studied are along Jackson Street, Main Street, Nevada, and New York Avenue. And then we also, ins also studied Murdoch up on the north there. What we did was we did how we did this, these are the parameters for the traffic study. We took counts in May of 2021, and as everybody knows, we are, we, that was the tail end, we're still in, but it's basically the tail end of the COVID conditions. Um, so just to make sure that our volumes were quote unquote normal or, or at least higher up, up to what they were prior to COVID, we took a look at uh, the Jackson Street study that was done by Ayers. There was some counts done in 2019, in November of 2019, and we compared our counts to those, and then based on that, we factored up. Some, some of the movements were higher, some were lower, 
where they were lower, we factored them up to be similar or normal, quote unquote, normal to the 2019 volumes. We also used uh, East Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission's background growth rate to, because of our analysis, we did an opening year and a design year, so in order to go out 10 years, we, we use the growth rate that is approved by East Central and use that uh, into in the traffic study numbers. For the school itself, the opening year, was we used a population of 770 students. That's what's anticipated. We also included a potential growth to 850 students. We included traffic for the 850 students in the future year or the design year, 10 years out. We included the 770 students in the opening year. We also coordinated with the school district and came up with uh, percentages of students that are expected to come via driving, via bus, or via walking and bike and biking. That, those were broken out by each of the uh, elementary schools that are feeding the, the middle school, and those are shown in the upper right-hand corner there, with the dark dashed line being the, the area that's feeding the uh, feeding this new middle school. So we came up again working with the school district, uh, came up with percentages that were. Walking versus busing, for instance, the area in the blue would have a higher busing percentage than the area right in the middle that's in green. Uh, we put all that, mixed it in, and did our analysis. And you can see under analysis parameters, the last section on the slide, we did an analysis for the opening year, we did an analysis for the interim year, which I'll explain in a second, and then we did an analysis for the 10-year design. The interim year we, we included because there will be one year where the middle school, the current middle school will be closed and, and all the, the students will be shifted to the new middle school, but the existing elementary will school will stay open and students from the other elementary school will be moving to that school. So for that particular year, we, we, there will be students in both the new middle school and the elementary school. We looked at three different peak periods. We looked at the morning school arrival, we looked at the school dismissal, and we also looked at a special event, an after school special event traffic, and uh, analyzed all three of those. And we also looked at two traffic flow scenarios. Uh, as Nate said, we looked at the one-way pair with Kentucky uh, heading southbound and Central heading northbound. But we also looked at a scenario where Kentucky Street would be cul-de-sac, and I'll show you that on the next two slides, these two the two traffic flow patterns. So here's the first one with uh, Kentucky Street southbound and Central heading northbound. The blue is the inbound traffic, the red is the exiting traffic, and as you can see, a lot of the traffic is, is anticipated to come um, in through Jackson on Nevada and in through uh, uh, Nevada on Main Street. There's with some small percentage of traffic coming up Central Street. Under this scenario, all the traffic leaves, once it enters the school in the upper left corner, all that traffic will, will leave um, heading southbound on Kentucky with some traffic heading over towards Custer, but the majority heading down to Kentucky. Under this next scenario that I talked about, the cul-de-sac scenario, the difference on this one, as you can see, was that we looked at Kentucky being cul-de-sac or broken between Custer or south of Custer. And under this scenario, the traffic heading to the parking lots would all come off of uh, New York Street and up Kentucky into the two parking lots. The drop-off tra traffic would be very much like the, the previous scenario. However, under this scenario, for the drop-off traffic, when, when they exit the main entrance to the school, they would take a left on Custer and head east on Custer, and then circle back around to the north. It pushes a lot more traffic up to Nevada. So um, based on the analysis, we determined that this scenario wasn't the optimal scenario, but this scenario with Kentucky Street with the two streets both operating full length and one way would be the optimal scenario. We looked at the, we analyzed all the intersections as I talked about. Um, I know you can't see this, I, I, that's not the intent of this slide, um, but the slide is showing the level of service and uh, the cues and the delays for all the movements. And what this shows in the far right column under the two, scenario, under the two tables there, the column on the left is the existing condition and all intersections are operating better than level service D, which is 35 seconds of delay or less. And on the right, that's the preferred alternative. That um, the, All the intersections, again, are operating better than level service D at 35 seconds or, or better. In addition to looking at analysis, we were also asked to look at parking on site. And uh, we looked at that special event like I talked about. So what we looked at was a, a higher, one of the higher events, which would be a basketball game, where there'd be a first game at 4 o'clock and another game at 5 o'clock. 
and with a general uh, attendance of around 250 total total people. What the table shows is the, there's three columns in there. There's the supply, the demand, and the excess or shortage. So this is a supply of approximately 158 spaces on the site. For the first game, we anticipate about 135 are being used. So there's an excess of, of spaces within the lots for the first game. The second game is going to overlap with the first game because it starts at five. So when those parents and or students show up, there's going to be a need for 300 total spaces. So there's going to be a shortage of 142 spaces on site. However, along Kentucky Street, there's approximately 83 sites, 83 spots to park along there. So what that means is that there would be a shortage of around 59 spaces that would need to be accommodated within the neighborhood um, out on the streets. So basically, that, that was the study in a nutshell. Um, the recommendations of the study were to convert Kentucky Street one way southbound, Central Street one way northbound, provide, as, as Nate mentioned, a single uh, utility access drive off Jackson. We actually looked at a single and two and uh, came to the conclusion that one would work just fine. Um, and we also recommend enhanced pedestrian crosswalks uh, adjacent to the school up at Nevada and Kentucky on the approaches there and also uh, on, uh, uh, sorry, Custer. For parking recommendations, we recommend to only have loading restrictions at the school entrance and uh, during the other hours, the school day hours, to have two hour parking along the adjacent streets, Kentucky and Central. And then uh, at the north end of Central and the south end of Kentucky, to restrict parking within 100 feet of the adjacent roadways to allow for a dedicated left turn and right turn onto those streets. Uh, but other than that, uh, during non-school hours, no restrictions of parking would be recommended, just the two hours during the day. And these last two slides are just renderings that show uh, hmm. the bus lot at the north end and the main entrance uh, on, the, on the northeast corner of the, of the site, um, showing the drop off and also uh, a, a bump out dedicated parking lane along the west edge of, uh, of Kentucky Street. And so that is it for the presentation and happy to answer any questions. If you could for me, yep, actually right there. Oh, sorry. Yep. Right there. Um, traffic northbound on Central. Is it your recommendation that we potentially restrict left turns to go westbound on Custer from Central? Uh, they would be allowed, um, but ideally, yes. Ideally, yes. You could allow them and just not <coughs> allow any traffic um, over on Custer to to, uh, um, to make a right turn. You'd say no right turn. From Kentucky? From, if you're, if you're coming from Central, head north, turn left on Custer, yep. and then just have a no right turn sign um, on Kentucky so that you would only have to turn, you could only turn. Well, I, I would hope we'd post a, uh, a one-way sign at the, uh, the intersection yep. to make that clear. My, uh, my fear is someone's going to be northbound on Central and want to shortcut it and go west on Custer and drop their kid at the corner of Custer, Kentucky, and cause a, uh, a huge, for lack of a better term, snap sure. at that corner. We, we yeah, any insight there? We assume that all the traffic that was coming in would head north up to Nevada and come back around. So, so yes, I think that's a fatal, uh, fatal assumption. Um, quite honestly, because I don't think that's going to happen. I would strongly suspect people are going to make that left onto Custer. Just my uh, my two cents mm. on that one. If they did, I, I wouldn't see that being a problem from an intersection operation standpoint. Um, At Central and Custer, but what about Custer and Kentucky? That's a problem. Am I wrong? Uh, it, it could be, yeah. And we, we analyzed it that it would all come around. We, I, I can't answer that. We didn't specifically look at that scenario. We, we assumed it would come around. But adding the signage to that location, if that was a request to the board or recommendation to the board, we, we could advise, you know, we could provide well, that. Well, and again, I, I, my, my fear is not people are going to go 
northbound on a southbound only street, my fear is we're going to wind up with more traffic at that intersection than we want. Couple that with the fact that per your drawing, the exit from that, uh, that drop off for visitor parking exits right at Custer as well. Mm -hmm. So you've got traffic into that intersection from both directions. Actually, all the, all the parking, I'm going to go back up to the site plan. So um, there, there is, you're, you're right, there is a drop off lane out in front of the school or, or a, a um, visitor parking spot. Yeah. yeah, there's a visitor park, parking area out in front of the school, but all of the parking um, is down to the south. So the intent of that visitor parking area isn't to use it as a pickup drop off area. Um, that's why the extra lane, extra parking lane has been added to the west side of Kentucky. So we don't anticipate a lot of vehicles will be pulling out of that visitor parking area. There's only space for about 10 parking spaces up, up at that area. I think your concern is still valid. I, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, we just didn't analyze it that way. Um, but to your point, I, I think we could consider uh, you know, a no left-hand turn from northbound and central onto Custer. Which then means makes it a uh, an enforcement concern, but it's better than nothing. Anyone else? Did you can't but consider putting a cul-de-sac at the end of Custer so it blocked off? Um, what is it, Central? Or not Central, Kentucky from yeah. Custer? Uh, we didn't because um, traffic, that would force all traffic down to New York, so we, we would want the traffic that is heading, that wants to head back north, say on Main Street, mm -hmm. to have a more direct route. So basically it disperses the traffic to different intersections, which will, will help the overall transportation network. Okay. Um, and I, I agree with Dan. I think that's that, that could be definitely be a problem. Um, could uh, Custer be, let's say, one way between uh, Kentucky and Central, one way uh, going east? It absolutely could. Yes. I mean, that might be a solution. With all due respect, though, Bill, I think that uh, that's going to cause more confusion once you uh, once you get to Central. Having a, I mean, we've got on the east side already. On, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's CB, where it uh, goes from a two-way to a one-way mm -hmm. at an intersection. But my biggest fear in this whole process is throwing the uh, the paradigm of that neighborhood on its head, because these have been one-way streets for <laughs> thirty plus mm -hmm. years. Again, some of you have lived in this town longer than I have. Yeah. But, it's uh, it's been a long time. <laughs> and if we uh, we flip these, we've got to be really careful about how, where, when, and why it's done, because otherwise we're going to have uh, a mess the first uh, first few days of school, yeah, if not well, the first months of school. Be a big transition, yeah. We did meet but from loading and unloading. That uh, makes oh, sense. Oops, Go ahead. I'm sorry about that. Oh, it's no, no worries. Um, we did meet with the residents, and, uh, and a, a good group of residents showed up. Um, and we really didn't hear a lot of opposition about the traffic. I, I, you know, I, I, I hear what I understand what you're saying, and, and um, I guess anticipated more, but really didn't hear. Yeah, I believe we had 25 residents within two blocks of the site. Um, you know, all, all come to the neighborhood meeting and. And there were concerns brought up, but nothing from a, a flipping of the one-way perspective. Not yeah. saying that it won't happen, because it will, right? People people have got used to it over the last 30 years or plus uh, are used to it one way, but um, we were surprised, honestly, to, to not have heard that concern. But I think getting uh, the grasp for student safety as would they approach the school, and uh, as everyone knows, uh, a kid comes out from behind a car, uh, a, a, a car coming down a lane of traffic, simply does not have enough time and it's in an ex extremely unsafe situation. So with that knowledge in their back pocket, I think they can understand why we did what we did. But, and again, I, I, I don't take great exception to the flipping of the streets. We just need to communicate it yep. far enough in advance. What my concern really is, is that corner of 
again, um, Custer and Kentucky. Is there a way to uh, to move that outlet further south? So is that out of the visitor parking? Yes. That could be, yes, I think that could happen. But um, to make that worthwhile, it's got to be a good 50 to 60 feet would be my... Yeah, I mean, in talking with uh, the city officials, uh, they have encouraged us to actually have some of those portals, whether it is the one on Jackson Street or we didn't specifically talk about this one as it uh, comes in with Custer and, and, uh, and, and Kentucky, but to have that at the, a true kind of T intersection spot um, because we realize that having the access points, you know, like you're saying, slightly offset um, is more troublesome from a traffic perspective and a safety perspective. Um, and I mean, the building is a big building, don't get me wrong, um, but by the, if we were to extend that loop 50 or 60 feet south, we'd almost, we'd be really, really close to the, the parking entrance on the north side. That, that blue volume that you see on the screen is somewhere in the neighborhoods of 150 feet long. So if you imagine, you know, bringing down 60 feet, you get extremely close to the parking lot entrance. And again, that, that visitor parking at, at the north um, approach that you're talking about there, the, the west approach of the Custer intersection, has 10 parking spaces. Uh, I don't expect a high volume using that, that approach. But by the same token, you, you're you gonna have cars parked facing a southerly direction on the west side of Kentucky, cars exiting the visitor parking, and potentially cars, again, unless we assume we, uh, we disallow left turns, cars trying to turn southbound onto Kentucky from Custer. So you're gonna have three traffic flows competing for that, uh, that space. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. No, we would, unless we, unless we made Custer one way. Well, I think what you could do um, is, well, obviously I understand um, Mr. Becker's point. I think that obviously the school district and as well as the city can work as well, we, you know, when it gets closer to time, we'll obviously have to educate the public about any traffic changes, but there's a potential we could, you know, restrict left-hand turns during school hours, um, similar to like what we do, um, you know, we'll have to de determine what that is, whether that's during peak hours before and after or during, um, you know, during school days, during school hours. Um, so that's another alternative, but then obviously then we'd have to count on our, um, the, the police department and our enforcement officers to actually educate and enforce that at least for the for the initial period where people are getting used to it so that's that's probably something that uh, we could look at because I do understand the concern I wouldn't be as concerned about it during the school day but yeah before and after school if people determine that's a shortcut to go up central come cut across and then you know make that you yeah there I can see the concern Oh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's even a possibility. I think it's a, oh, a, a definite. If people have the option, they're going to take it. Yep. It's, that's, it's that's, Madhouse whenever I, I, school I lets in or gets out. I don't even know. <laughs> Just one piece to note, and thank you for the, the team to remind me. The, the visitor parking lot, I would say there, there's approximately 10 stalls up there. Uh, seven to eight of those stalls are ADA stalls, um, and with two to three just being a regular parking stall. So uh, the volume of traffic is supposed, um, from a, a school district perspective, is to not allow um, people to use that drive during those peak hours. Um, and then those that are, 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 are probably uh, very infrequent given the quantity of regular versus uh, ADA parking stalls in that loop. So just another layer of information that I didn't have been shared before. And that, minim still, that minimizes it a, a tad but we still got to uh, got to fight the uh, the cars on the west westbound the west side excuse me of Kentucky okay. dropping kids um, so you've you've cut the problem by I would argue about five percent but it's still a problem in my opinion regardless of our best intentions um, I know 
Ross has spent quite a bit of time at a school. Um, I know I, uh, I have a bird's eye view on uh, school traffic, um, Bill has. as Bill does. Um, the best laid plans don't, uh, don't always work the way they're uh, initially intended, which is why I tried to bring a little bit more of a critical eye <laughs> Human nature. to this. Well, I also, I, I, you know, one thing to, to point out also is the amount of traffic that's coming up Custer, we don't expect to be significant. The, the majority of the traffic we expect to be coming in off of Nevada, either through Main Street or off of Jackson. Uh, so uh, the, that, was, that was our assumption, and, and because of where the, where the students are, where the parents are coming from, uh, we felt that they would use the main, the more of the main streets rather than um, cutting through the neighborhood there. Um, okay. As, be, 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 I'll get to you in a second, Bill. As someone, and, and Mr. Fox can attest to this, as someone who lives on a, uh, arguably a secondary street near a school, the volume that goes up and down that secondary street is, pardon my, uh, pardon my choice of words, but ginormous by comparison. Because people see it as a easy route in and out, which ultimately it doesn't turn into because everybody figures that out pretty quickly. So again, I go back to the best laid plans. Don't always have the intended result. Bill. Um, I see another safety concern and that is Central Street uh, when it's, uh, okay, Kentucky is going to go uh, south, Central is going to go north, and for one year, all the elementary school students from Washington, Emmeline, Cook, Webster, Mer and Merrill are going to be going to that that plant, that, that yeah. building. And um, there are going to be lots of parents that are going to be dropping off and picking up their students, So, and they're going to be younger and uh, you know, probably less wary of traffic than the uh, the the middle school students. So I, I see that as a as an issue also that you know they're going to be dropped. You're going to be going north on Central, and I don't know if they're going to have some. Uh, they're going to change it somehow for uh, student drop off, but they would have the same issue where the students would get out on the right side of the car, have to go around the front. Sure. Yeah, that's a valid point. I think that there is a pl or plenty of opportunity on New York to not allow that to happen, but I would say, to your point, New York is not as long as the other two streets, so lining up on southbound of Kentucky going for that one year interim period uh, would be an issue. And um, we've, we've realized the issue. Um, however, it is an interim year. So uh, looking at this, this facility, this site, that you know, we are supposed to be designing a, a building, a site to last 60, 80, 100 years, um, we, we needed to be cognizant uh, to the long-term solution, knowing that we're going to have a year of, 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 of growing pains and, and as it relates to the existing mural building. And I know I stood out there and watched the elementary school uh, load and unload uh, along Kentucky, and uh, staff, including the principal, were all out there. Um, they're they're pretty, they're very safe about students crossing the street because there's a parking lot across the street. There were parents that dropped off on both sides of the street, and um, they were, again, they were very very careful. Uh, so the, the staff basically acted as crossing guards there. I would imagine that that would be the same case under that interim. And also in that interim year, I mean, I didn't know if it would be necessary, but I, I can say it anyways. Washington will still be operating at the Washington site in the one year interim, and Emmeline Cook will not be coming to this site. So it's really the Webster Stanley Elementary School and the Merrill Elementary School kids that will come to this site. I um, just wanted to clarify that the other two buildings. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, Anyone else with a comment or a question? Well, then I'm going to throw in my next one. Um, the cost associated, should we move forward with this, Mr. Collins, is whose responsibility? Um, the, we haven't discussed that specifically, but the, the school district um, would be willing to pay for that cost. 
Am I correct? Mr. Fox is here, so school is good on it. That's what I understand. Assuming there's uh, Mr. Fox, some means of conveyance of information that we can, uh, should we decide to move forward through the school district to communicate this properly to all the existing and future, at least for a year or two, Merrill, although obviously that's not gonna be the name, students to communicate that we flipped everything should the council decide, decide to do that? Yeah, I'm certain that we will develop uh, a communication strategy to reach out to the community and start the building process of what the strategies will be. I mean, my hope is the city does it as well, but better, uh, better two, uh, two points than uh, than. Then what, just one more Go question. Go ahead, Bill. Absolutely. When when are you planning to switch the direction so that people get a chance to get used to it? Yeah, so we're open to that. Um, we, we figured uh, a, a period of three to six months seems appropriate to get people accustomed uh, to traffic flow prior to the building opening. So if we uh, looked at a August, uh, mid-August opening for the building, uh, sometime in what would that be March uh, February March seems mm -hmm. like the right time to to make such traffic switch if the city agreed I think we'd probably switch it at the end of the school year prior to opening and that would give you know a good three months before school would start that would be my initial thought because I don't think we would want to flip it you know during a school year I think if we did it at the end of one school year, you'd get the whole summer to educate everybody prior to the next school year. Um, that was my initial thought anyway. Yeah, typically we see it after a winter break, after a spring break, or like general reference after the school year. Very like this. Any other questions? Anyone else? I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but... Uh my, uh, my other and, and slightly less comfortable question is when was the realization made that uh, this was going to be necessary to flip these two streets? Yeah, so, travel? so going back to why the building is faced a certain direction um, is really when I think it became aware that the direction flip of the one ways would be necessary. Every time, uh, whether it was pre-referendum or post-referendum, because it was reviewed multiple times in the process, was where is the secure entrance or quote unquote um, the front of, of, of the building located? And again, I don't believe we have any backs of the building, but the secure entrance, right? Where do the visitors come between eight and four? And um, th that space is typically where majority of the students come at the beginning of the day where they expel at the end of the day and um, putting that on Jackson Street side um, was not favored by any of the multiple multiple members of the core planning team um, within the district administration within principals um, within staff at OASD um, it was not favored uh, to put uh, that secure entrance on the Jackson Street corridor from a laying out of the building, obviously you can tell that we have some neighbors that we just need to be friendly with, and um, and we feel like we've we've done a pretty good job at that. That putting the uh, main entrance or the secure entrance on the north side of the site would be very inappropriate um, due to the fact that really the only great spot for parking is in the southern portion of our site. So forcing. Um, someone in a wheelchair, someone with a disability, uh, someone coming for their grandchild or, or their child's uh, game at 4 p.m. Um, from the very southern port point of the site all the way to the northern point of the site um, seemed very inappropriate. So the only logical space for the secure entry, for the safety entry um, of this building was to place it on either the south side of the building or the uh, or really kind of the middle of the building facing Kentucky Street. Um, so when it was decided that that was one of the two locations, and thinking about parent drop off, thinking about parent pickup, and the quantity of students attending this site, 
Um, again, going back to the crossing of the vehicles and dropping off on the right side and not having to cross traffic, it was very apparent to us that flipping the one ways was necessary. Long answer to a, uh, a relatively, what I thought was a simple question. Um, I let just me, to explain oh, the I get it. Um, but let me uh, let me put a finer point on the question, which you never really addressed, which is pre-referendum decision or post-referendum decision. Both. It was analyzed twice. Was it communicated? And again, shame on me for not knowing this, but was it communicated to the public that this was a possibility pre-referendum? Fair enough. Anyone else? Anything you'd like to throw in, Mr. Fox, since you're here? No, I think all the points were good. Uh, just one item I didn't hear was um, your concern of the income year for students. I just want to remind the commission that uh, uh, when New York was rebuilt, we uh, we did work with the city and we did widen that street, so we did have a we do have a drop off area, a dedicated drop off area along New York Avenue to the south side of Merrill School, which will help uh, with buses as a safe place to drop students off during the entry year. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'm going to bring this back to the board here for discussion um, I'm going to ask that this be amended I'm going to move to amend to restrict left hand turns on to Custer from Central do you want to just a matter of clarification Dan do you want to we went through the president do you want to like introduce item two which is the actual Item. Oh, sure. Hey, Sorry. We can yeah. Do that. Shame. Yeah. Yep. yeah thanks. All right. <laughs> Thank you for keeping me honest and according to Robert's hey, rules of order. That part of the motion. That's right. Yep. There you go. All right. So let's uh, let's move to agenda two. Request to flip one way pairs of Kentucky Street and Central Street between West New York Ave and West Nevada Ave. That's the first. Yep. And just for clarification for anybody that's watching, so basically, so this is the follow up item based on the presentation um, of the traffic impact analysis. So obviously the school district in conjunction with their consultants are requesting to flip these one ways, which we just heard the reasons why to allow for the safer traffic and pedestrian bicycle movements um, and reduce the need for left hand turns, which will make it safer um, other than what uh, we were discussing earlier. So, so again, I, uh, I restate my, uh, my desire, my motion to amend to disallow left turns from central on to Custer. Are you going to be doing it for full time or are you going to be doing it during school hours? Always. 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 Yeah. Always. Thank you. Well, only for the only the, re the only reason being is, um, and again, our uh, a representative in blue back there, I would think it's going to be a little bit easier from an enforcement perspective and it will certainly be, serve to be less confusing um, for the, uh, what, six or eight, six or seven houses that uh, have to deal with Custer in that look excuse me location it establishes a habit to right us. exactly so there it is uh, a motion to amend to disallow left turns on the Custer 24 7 from Central Going once. You need that as a motion. I, I, well, I, I made the motion. I need a second to. Okay. I, I will second that. Any discussion on the amendment other than what we've already had? Seeing none, I'm going to ask that roll be called on the amendment as stated. Staples? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Monschneider? Aye. Ecker? Aye. Christensen? Aye. So now we have a newly amended item. Um, I'm going to uh, throw yet another one into the mix. And again, I don't know if this is appropriate, Mr. Collins, but do we have any, uh, any jurisdictional oversight to 
essentially forced the school district to make no right turn, excuse me, no left turn out of their visitor parking facility. Because if it sits where it sits, I don't want people cutting across to Custer, regardless of where it winds up. If it moves 10 feet south, sure as the, uh, the sun's coming up in the east, someone's going to uh, try and zigzag their way to Custer. Well, I think if we leave it, if you leave the current layout like it is where it lines up with Custer, obviously they can't turn left there. Um, so you're talking about if it would move. If the, well, it wouldn't be enforceable if it's something coming out of a private driveway. And I don't know if you know anything different, but that's what I understand from, because I think we have a similar condition at- um, Traeger. Traeger, yep. where with all the best intentions and no left turn sign was put up, but it's unenforceable because it's on private property. Can we, uh, can we put the no left turn or no right turn, whichever, I mean, for, for future reference, can we put that sign on the city right of way and thereby make it enforceable as opposed to putting the sign on school district property? So you're talking, can you restate what you were asking again. To, uh, to make left turns prohibited coming out of that driveway. Again, my fear is if that driveway is even slightly close to being lined up with Custer, people are going to zig it and zag it. Are you referring to this driveway here? No. Or this no, driveway? this one. So if you're, if you're what, what would a no left turn here? You'd be going against the, the, the newly flipped pairs. You would, but if the driveway's here, again, sure as the sun comes up in the east, someone's going to do that. Well, and I, did, I didn't speak earlier, but moving it 10 feet south would go against Municipal Code Chapter 25 as far as access control and intersection spacing. So per that, I would, as DPW, would recommend it to stay right where it is. And hypothetically, it does move south. No left turns, I can't speak for OPD, but I don't believe is enforceable. What would be enforceable is going the wrong way out on, on a one way. As Mr. Fox will attest, that happens at a couple of our schools already. <clears throat> part of the part of the idea I thought with that driver right there was to send people just east, get them get them out of there as they come out of the lot. That was supposed to be part of what they could do. So they they'd want it to line up so they could do that, wouldn't they? I, uh, again, I I fully understand that, but that goes to my point of causing a, uh, as I said before, a snafu at that corner because you've got three competing traffic flows potentially for that same space. Yeah, I guess personally, I don't see why anybody would, you can't turn left there because it's a one way. And I would, I, I think from staff perspective, we're recommending that that driveway stay there aligned with, um, with Custer. Okay, that's fair. I, uh, I wanted to make sure that it I got aired. We, I know with, uh, well, Mr. Garrix, our city engineer, I know we've, we talked about that when they brought this forward and that was the recommendation to, and that was part of the reason to line that up with, with Custer. Anyone else? Well, I, uh, I'm gonna come out and say it and uh, show my hand. Um, given that, uh, that alignment, um, I, I cannot, will not support this because it's, uh, it's a potential problem from a traffic flow perspective. Again, I think enough of us have uh, observed school traffic. And again, I don't intend to beat the same dead horse, but I see it nearly every day. The best laid uh, plans don't turn out the way they're intended. <clears throat> Would oh. other signage work? Um, no, because it's, uh, it has more to do with the, uh, the placement of the, uh, the driveway. You can't, uh, I don't know what sign you'd put at the end of that driveway to disallow people from going straight on the Custer. No through traffic? Well, that doesn't really work. I guess I'm, and I'm new, relatively new on here. I, I would think going on, what would, going with the driveway where it is lined up with Custer, what problem does that cause? If I may, traffic comes this way on Custer. Yeah. You've got cars parked here 
on Kentucky. You've also got cars in this parking lot trying to get out. So right there, you got yourself one, uh, one snarl, big time. You've already put the no turn left onto Custer though, so yeah. that removes the one for the first direction you're saying? It does, potentially, but you've still got traffic southbound here, potentially picking their kids up from over here. There will definitely be crossing guards there as well to help reduce. For pedestrian traffic. Yes. Not for vehicular traffic, unless they're going to stop traffic, which they can't theoretically legally do, other than for pedestrians. I can say from a traffic standpoint, I don't see that being a big concern. I, I think that traffic's going to be relatively minimal. That, you know, like we said, if we restrict that left turn on to um, Custer, like Ms. Hanson said, you're restricting traffic one way there. You only have like 10 parking stalls there. Um, I would assume that most of the traffic is going to be entering from Nevada if they're gonna drop their kids off and then exiting south. I just don't see that being a very busy intersection and especially with limiting those left turns coming one way. Um, so I guess I'll respectively disagree that I think that's not gonna be an issue. Right. You said that you're going to try to keep people out of the visitor parking, or that's, that's correct. Like, that's During so peak times, pick up and drop off. Uh, school has agreed to have principals out there, and whether that results in cones or whatever that okay. ends up being, to um, restrict parents from using that loop yeah. as a drop off. So that takes another part of it away. If we're not able to put a sign up, no left turns or crossing, at least the cones are there with all the people helping, because I drive past Merrill all the time during peak panic times. There are teachers out there left and right. Um, I used to live over by Oakwood. They've got cones everywhere. They're trying to be safe. If parents really want to crack their cars up doing that, I mean, give them a month, they'll figure it out. <laughs> There's just nothing that I see that we can do Good. other than you've already limited the left-hand turn. It it is. And the signage would be that you can't turn left, obviously, exactly. down a one-way street. And per city code, if we can't move it, I mean, I don't understand why you don't support it. Um, 30 years of living uh, adjacent to a school property and watching, uh, watching unintended consequences regularly. That corner could also be regulated a little better, too. Which corner? The one you live on. Um, I've tried many, many times to no avail. Um, which goes to your point of school district oversight. And I, I don't mean to take this far afield, but that, uh, that blows like the wind. Sometimes it's in place, sometimes it's not. So I'm not willing to, uh, to jeopardize pedestrian safety and vehicular safety on the uh, the presence of someone at that corner. So I'm going to be voting no, plain and simple. So unless someone else has a comment, I'm going to ask it, uh, ask that roll be called. Bill, is that a hand up or are you just? No, I'm just. Okay. All right. Well, then please call the roll on agenda two. Since I'm first, this is on the motion as amended without the left hand. Correct. Right. Okay. Staple. Okay. Aye. Zinski? Hansen? Aye. Wanschneider? Aye. Becker? New. Christensen? Aye. All right, which moves us to the review of the poll call survey regarding where bikes should and should not be allowed in the city. All right. All right, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Um, this, uh, the, the city ran a, a poll call survey, and this was in conjunction when the, um, there's been some requests for e-scooters, and the city was discussing how and where e-scooters may be regulated. And when that item was being discussed, the uh, city manager asked us to um, to do a survey and just to get because there was a little bit of a discussion with bikes and where they're allowed, just to get some information. Um, get the survey out so how, what people thought about bikes and pedestrians, um, specifically about bikes, where they should be allowed and where they shouldn't be allowed. Um, so the city did do a poll call survey and, at, and I attached that to your packets. 
the survey is also as well as the results. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, it was just for informational purposes and to give some background to council for future discussions on what people thought about bikes and sidewalks. And um, in general, you know, without going through the whole survey, it, 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 most people were supportive of continuing to allow bikes on sidewalks. Um, so this study will be sh was shared with the Bike and Pedestrian Committee, and it will also be shared with council. And like I said, it's basically just to guide any future discussions on the topic, so there's some information for people to have. Anyone? Any feel I saw on the, the last page of it, it gave the age demographics anyhow, mm -hmm. but how was this publicized? How did they pick the sample group? How did they? Well, it, it's basically, it's set up yeah, on the software the city uses called Polco. Okay. So if you're a registered user, you get the survey. Um, and then it's also, it's also publicized through Oshkosh Community Media, um, as well as some of the newsletters that go out, and, and it also was on the city website. So okay. that's kind of how it got out there. Um, so who would be a registered user? I think, <laughs> I, I don't know exactly how many there are, but I think there's like a thousand right now. And I don't I know. Like them. I don't know, if, Mark, if you have any more information on that. But. I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, was this a valid sample? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah, when I read it, 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 it was not the impression I had. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Mr. Lyons is our planning director, if anybody doesn't know him, so I can't yeah. help with the survey. So Polco, it, it, it's been one of the concerns we've had over any survey that's been used. Um, we do our best to promote it as a city and try to get as many people to sign up as we can. Or people to sign up for it and it isn't an elective decision people make to get those poll co surveys. Um, sure. The responses we saw here are similar to most of the poll co surveys we've done. For the demographic, the age group is pretty much the only demographic. Correct. You we, have, we have some abilities based on the type of survey to collect some different demographic information. No, do they have kids? Don't the they have kids? That type of thing. Kind of thing. You know, what might be we, we, have, we can ask those questions in the poll co surveys. Um, Oshkosh Media does a lot of writing these surveys for us based on their their experience in doing them. Okay. Anyone else? Well, I just want to, you know, the cross cross section right, of uh, replies. How how do you can you determine that? In terms of the demographic information. Yeah. I mean that's why we typically provide you with that information so you can look at it and, and take it into consideration when viewing those results. That's why we use it as kind of a supplemental piece of information, one of many tools the city has when it tries to make decisions. I, I guess, and I appreciated that, so thank you for doing that, but my concern was as I read this, at least I didn't get read the whole thing, but the bits and pieces I read, it was like you were either on the side that really wanted it or you really hated it. That <laughs> seemed to be the people that it attracted, and I don't know if that's representative of the general public in Oshkosh. I guess most people don't have it. I can't say it's representative of, this, of the entire city. It is representative of most survey results that we get. Typically, the people that choose to complete those surveys have a strong opinion one way or the other. <laughs> Reading Unfortunately, the nature of the surveys, I believe. <laughs> yeah, so, but then are you planning based on 2% on either extreme of the population? Well, and that's why we only use it as one tool. You know, it's, a, it's a starting point. As Jim said, it's a starting point to as discussion moves further along. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions, that moves us to staff statements. Mr. Collins. I do not have anything further tonight. I will then entertain a, oops, I'm sorry, future agenda requests. All right, seeing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned.